Hey everybody, it's Armand. Today I want to talk to everybody about heat exchangers. So specifically we'll be discussing heat exchangers in the format of oil coolers. As you'll see I have a stack of oil coolers behind me, five different ones to be exact, and I'm going to go over a bunch of the ins and outs of all of them, and I also am performing an experiment to produce actual results on them. Now let's back up a little bit. Um, I have a background, mechanical engineer degree, and my background was oil field where we did design and manufacture of subsea equipment. I was in charge of doing a lot of design, the manu seeing the manufacturing happen, doing design reports, and a lot of calculation. But none of my actual field work, uh, engineering field work, had anything to do with heat transfer. So I'm using the best of my information and knowledge that I gained through my college classes as well as reviewing a bunch of textbooks and seeing some other people's uh, work on heat exchangers in order to come up with all of the information I have. Um, so the information we'll be going over is not specific to automotive heat exchangers either. Uh, automotive heat exchangers can be anything from your, your radiators, your condensers, uh, even your evaporator core, your heater core, uh, and in our case we're going over the oil coolers. All of the stuff I'm doing is in the pursuit of oil cooler information. But again, the information is universal. So why are we testing? It's because one size just does not fit all. You can put one on your car and you can figure out if it brings your stuff down to a reasonable temperature, keeps you from overheating it, but one size does not fit all. It physically will not fit in some cars or it's not big enough for one car. It, the one size does not fit all. So I wanna give quantitative data actual numerical data comparing all of these exchangers versus each other. So uh, through all of this experimental stuff, I want to be able to produce numbers that everyone can understand and compare, and hopefully just be better for the community. Um, again, all the information I'm giving is to the best of my knowledge and the best of my research, so I am open for um, input, people who have actual in the field experience with heat exchangers, I would love your input. Unfortunately, with my group of peers, I have mostly peers that are uh, automotive enthusiasts or engineers that work in similar fields to myself. So uh, again, I, I did the best I could with the best information that I was able to come up with. So uh, I, am open for, I am open for criticism and hopefully we can improve all of this uh, and you know better information for the community. That's what I'm about. Uh, this is my introduction. Now we'll move on to the meat and potatoes. Right, so let's start in on how heat exchangers work. So the heat exchanger is a device that exchanges heat between two fluids. They can be two liquids, two gases, a f one liquid, one gas. Um, you can even have multiple depending how you configure it. But in our case, what we'll be discussing is two fluid interactions, um, air versus a liquid. So in automotive world, we have usually something mounted in the front of the car uh, or ducted, however you have it, and the air will be coming into the car and it will be passing over the device and cooling it off because it has a hot fluid running through it. I will go ahead and use this one as my handheld demonstration. Inside of this, there will be liquid flowing across it from end to end. Fluid enters at one side, goes across, leaves out of the other side. Air enters through this and enters out the back, uh, exits out of the back. So what you end up with is the air goes in ambient temperature, leaves hotter, the liquid comes in hot, and it leaves hopefully less hot. The amount of liquid, the amount of air, all of that stuff plays a factor. The type of fluids, there are a lot of ramifications. Uh, but the heat exchangers operate on the concept of forced convection, which is to say uh, we have to define what non-forced convection is first, natural convection. Natural convection is you have this thing generating heat and it naturally attempts to achieve equilibrium in its environment. So the environment is a lower temperature than the device and then it gives off heat. Forced convection is when you force air across it to try and pull the heat away. So in all of our applications, we treat these as forced convection. So all of the design characteristics are that uh, regarding forced convection. Um, in the nature of heat transfer, uh, we need to regard uh, Newton's law of cooling, which is that the farther apart two temperatures are, the faster they will attempt to come to equilibrium. So the hotter your fluid is going through here, the faster it will pull heat out of it 
with a cool fluid. So if you have 150 degree oil or 200 degree oil flowing through this, the 200 degree oil will have a faster cooling rate even though the 150 degree oil will start at a lower point, uh, the, the rate at which it will come down in temperature off of 200 degrees would be faster than 150 degrees, for instance. Uh, but that isn't to say that the 150 will actually cool off to a, cool, a colder point slower. It's just the instantaneous rate for those temperatures. Uh, same thing goes for the air. When the air goes in, if the air is super cold, it will get much hotter, much faster uh, than a cooler air. Uh, and then a lot of the stuff revolves around temperature differential in that respect as well. When you have a higher temperature differential, you can expect much better efficiency of your unit. As some of you may know, uh, when people say it's boost weather, it's because it's colder outside and the greater temperature differential allows much greater performance. Or those of us who have raced on hot summer days, it's 100 degrees out of the track and your car starts having much higher temperatures than, it, than you've seen other days. And that's, again, because the temperature differential has raised, uh, has, has gotten smaller by raising temperature, thus you have a smaller temperature differential. So your exchangers have to work harder. Uh, so there are different types of designs. The types of designs that we're looking at here are, these are mostly, well, they're all, all automotive exchangers are going to be what are called cross flow. And I know some of you know that word, but it is interpreted differently. In, in the engineering world, cross flow means that the one fluid runs this way and the other fluid runs this way. They are running perpendicular or orthogonal to each other. Whereas the convention in automotive, when you say cross flow, it means the inlet is at one corner and the outlet is at the other corner. Uh, that's not the same as we say in the engineering world, but just to be clear, cross flow in our case means the fluid goes this way, the air goes this way. Uh, next thing is single pass and dual pass. So. There are also multiple other passes, but single pass just means the fluid enters at one side, it leaves out of the other side. Dual pass means it enters at one side and it actually goes across and then it goes back and it leaves out um, like this one. This one, the fluid enters over here, it comes across and then it goes back out that way. So it makes two passes across the exchanger. There are some devices out there that may be triple pass, quadruple pass, however many passes. The next thing is there are also multiple rows that you can have, uh, or, or, well, rows we'll use in two different contexts here. This will be the only time I, I mention rows, but um, on most of these heat exchangers, you will have uh, one row, one, one deep, if you will. So when the fluid goes through, there is one plate here. If there were two plates in front of each other, it would be uh, two rows. And that is, that is using the word <laughs> row a little too much. Uh, this one, this one has one set of tubes in the front and another set right behind it. So they, the thickness of the exchanger may be this, but the first set of tubes is half the thickness and then there's a small air gap and a second set behind there. Uh, I'll show a cross section that shows the, the split of those. All right, next thing we need to discuss is the mixed versus the unmixed flow. So mixed versus unmixed flow is a, is a means by which to determine if the fluid itself is mixing with itself during the process. Uh, and what that means is when air goes through here, it has to travel through all these little tiny fins. And all these little fins in here separate the fluids. So as they're going through the exchanger, they have been separated. They are unmixed. And all of these here are unmixed on the airflow side. On the liquid flow side though, they can be unmixed or mixed. Only two of the exchangers here are actually unmixed. And that are that is this one and the larger version. Uh, inside of the tubes that are here, they have separations the whole way through the tube. So once the fluid enters one end of the tube, it doesn't reconvene with the other portions until it reaches the other end. This one and this one are mixed. They are definitely mixed in the inside and I'll show a cross section of the inside of, of these, uh, but the inside of these have what are called turbulators. So inside of the flow path here, there are these little devices, this, this, uh, it's, it's, it's a broken up looking plate that you stick in, that, that's stuck inside when it's manufactured, and it forces the flow to move around. What that does is it creates turbulence. They're called turbulators. The whole idea of turbulators is that you increase the turbulence inside of there, and it promotes heat transfer. Fluids, 
when they're moving laminarly, so smoothly, when they move, they, they tend to just stay in their own spot. Uh, it's kind of like color dispersion, if you've ever messed with food coloring. You drip some food coloring in a stream of water, it tends to draw a line and slowly disperse. Well, the heat is exactly the same. So if it's really hot fluid and you cool off the outside, the outside will stay pretty cool. The inside will stay hot because it's not mixing to the outside not very, not very uh, strong. So you could also consider that some means uh, in the in the same vein as natural convection versus forced convection. You are you're forcing it to move around. It helps for dispersion. Now, part of the trade-off of turbulators um, uh, in in place of unmixed fluid is that the unmixed fluid will have all of those fins inside of there, all those passages which increases your amount of contact area. So you increase your surface area by which you can transmit heat. But at the same time, it is a drawback because you get less turbulence in your flow. So a little bit of give and take. Uh, we, won't really have any, we won't really have any data in any of the experiments I've done here to suggest one versus the other because I'm not physically fabricating any of these exchangers. Otherwise, I could make two of them and then make the argument that one performs better than the other uh, for, for, that, for that sake. Uh, and then the the other way I'm going to be mentioning rows is in this context. Uh, the way that people identify a lot of these exchanges is how many rows they have. So in rows in this case, uh, and when I refer to rows here after, that's why I'll, which, this is what I'll be referring to. It's the amount of plates there are, or the amount of layers there are for for fluid flow. So on this one, this is a 19 row. There are 19 of these plates. There are 18 rows of fins. The fins being the little pieces in there that you, you know, that's just squiggly bent up uh, metal for conduction, uh, for um, convection, for extra surface area. Uh, and each of these plates is considered a row. So this is a 19 row. The other one over there is a 25 row. Uh, the other one's a 14 row. Uh, that's just a convention there. So what, what do we identify on heat exchangers? So when we're identifying characteristics of heat exchangers, we have to identify how much of the front cross section. So when you when I hold this in front of my face, you can't see me, uh, if at all, because of what is called the K factor. The K factor is how much obstruction is there across the face of this versus how much space, how much total cross sectional area there is. So how much of this frontal cross sectional area is actually airflow area? That is called K factor. Uh, another identifying thing people like to know about these is how much pressure loss there is. So depending how you design it, depending how open the passages are in here, how many turns they have to take, will dictate how much pressure loss there is. That's something easily measurable. You just have to measure pressure in, pressure out, that's it. Uh, which we do not take care of in this first series of experiments that I've run. I'll explain more later. And then the different fluids make an effect, as I mentioned. So some fluids are better at transferring heat. Other fluids are not. So why would we use one versus the other? Well, you have engine oil. You're stuck with how engine oil reacts to heat transfer. So you do your best you can to make it work within the heat exchangers you have. It has its own ability, its own what is called specific heat for carrying heat. So every unit of oil, every unit of mass, so every kilogram, carries a certain amount of energy per degree that it is heated. So one degree above ambient, it will carry a certain amount of kilojoules per kilogram. What that means, uh, that is a whole bunch of nonsense to mean when we go to calculate, um, if we find out that the amount of oil flowing through here is so many kilograms per second, then we can calculate how much energy the oil is actually transporting through the exchanger. And when I say transporting, I don't mean transferring. Transporting just how much oil going through here translates to how much energy it is bringing through the exchanger. Now, the other calculation we have to make is the air. How much energy can the air take? So the air going through has a much lower specific heat, which means it cannot hold a lot of energy. So we have to jam a ton of air through here in order to get it to pull away as much energy from the oil. So this can be our limiting factor. If there's not a lot of air, it doesn't matter how much oil is going through here, it can't cool it a lot. And then on the other side of things, if there's very little oil going through here, but there is a lot of air, you will do very well cooling off the oil. But again, they have different rates of, of uh, energy transfer. Uh, and then the last part of that would be, how do they interact inside of different exchangers? And that has to do with effectiveness, 
the overall heat transfer coefficient, and the surface area. All of those I'll describe later. Okay, so let's actually talk about which exchangers I have here. All these are identified as oil coolers or fluid heat exchangers. Um, they are all designed to work with air and oil, transmission fluid, whatever fluid you can put through it, uh, and even so they don't even need to be automotive. As I mentioned before, uh, the heat exchanger doesn't know it's in a car, uh, it just it does what it needs to when air goes through it and a fluid goes through it. So. All the heat exchangers I have here happen to be Mishimoto. I am not sponsored, but I am a dealer, and we leave these on hand because these are pretty popular, and we install them on a bunch of cars because we build a bunch of race cars that need to be cooled off. So this is probably the most common one you'll ever see, this style. Uh, a lot of other brands make this exact looking one. They all probably work exactly the same within you know a minor, minor percentage. Uh, but they are all considered a plate and fin style. I refer to these as traditional style because again, everyone knows what these look like, but this is a Mishimoto traditional 19 row. It is a plate and fin design. So they have plates and they have fins between them. They are brazed together. They have unmixed flow for the air and then they have mixed flow with turbulators through the plates. So I actually have two of these here. This one is the 19 row as I said, and then over here I have the 25 row. So you can see one is definitely larger than the other, but the construction is exactly the same. This one just has a couple of more rows. So you have your 19 row and your 25 row. Um, the way they construct these is they have a plate, like an end cap plate. They have the fins, they have another plate, and then they just braze all these together. So you can just keep stacking and stacking and stacking. These are available in a whole bunch of sizes, but for Michi and Moto, they're available in 10, 19, 25, and 35 row. And it just goes from being a short one to a really tall one. Um, so the fluid capacity on the little one is 15.52 ounces. I measured these myself. And then the larger one is a 23.04 ounce. So do what you want with that information. The, the dry weight of this one is 3.12 pounds. The dry weight of the other one is 4.33 pounds. Uh, for simplicity's sake, I'll just go ahead and put all the info on the screen for all of these, make it easier. But we'll discuss at least what I feel about the design wise. So as far as these traditional ones go, they have the smallest fins. So the fins are physically the, the shortest. They are only single pass, which does reduce uh, the, the efficiency of their ability to transfer heat. Uh, that is speculative though. I can, uh, we'll, we'll actually have numbers for that when we get around to the experimental data. Uh, the mounting on these requires a little bit of accommodation because you have top or bottom ports, depending how you're looking at it. So the issue that we have with these is there are arguments for both ways. If you mount it this way, your ports come out of the top. Cool. The moment you start the car, air bleeds out of it. Awesome, great, there's no air in the system. But when you go to oil change, how do you get the oil out of this? There's no drain cock on it. There's, there's no ability to drain it. So you say, okay, let's mount it upside down. Well, then we're back to the air problem. You can't get all the air out of it either when you start the car. So you could have a, a big bubble up in here and never get it out of there. Um, a workaround to this is you can mount it sideways, but in some cases, and in many of our cases, there's physically not enough space to mount something like this. Uh, these also, I have a speculation on these that if you were able to measure the amount of flow going through the top row versus the bottom row, that you would see a, a, a very drastic gradient of flow to where this one's flowing a lot and this one's flowing very little due to the path of least resistance. So uh, your fluid is going to be very quick to go across here, but it's not really gonna wanna go all the way to the bottom and across. So my speculation on these is that if you get a really small one, you're really not gonna to get too much of a difference going to a bigger one because it's still mostly gonna flow across the top of it. Given they do have the ability to uh, disperse heat throughout the whole unit, that's another, uh, that's again, that comes out in all of the experimental data. All right, um, the last thing about these is for experimental purposes, we considered the width of the core just where the fins were, so right here. So when we actually did the testing, we only tested over core area. We didn't put these out in the open like this, uh, but, but the thing is, if you look through here, there's just a very minor passage over here, uh, but the plates continue over. It just has to do with the way they're constructed. So those again are the, uh, the traditional style heat exchangers.
Next, we're going to discuss, this is called the Mishimoto Large Heavy Duty Dual Pass. This is the large version, so that implies there are smaller versions. There is a small, medium, and large. So the small is like half the size, the medium is like three quarter, and then of course, why would we bother with any other except for the large one? So this is the large one, it's available in two colors, unlike the other one which is available in all sorts of pretty colors. This one is by far the heaviest physically. It is bar and plate designed, as some of you may know what that means. You can see the plates are actually very thick on this one, but it also has a whole lot of fin area as well. And then again, as we mentioned earlier, this is a dual pass, so the fluid enters here split. So the, the end tank on this is split. The fluid runs all the way across and then all the way back. So it gets half of the flow area, but it gets twice of the flow distance. And a great thing about this is it's really not gonna have a strong distribution between the, the rows because they're so close together, you end up having a lot of really good flow through here. Uh, the dry weight on this is a 6.4 pounds. It is, it is the heftiest of all of them. And it also it doesn't hold the most fluid either, um, but uh, these have shown to work really well on cars. This one particularly I like because of fitment. Whenever you run into a problem where you have a lot of width, you don't have a lot of height, this works really well. We've installed these in like the grill of an S197 Mustang. This thing took up the whole upper grill because none of the other ones would have uh, been able to fit in the space. Well, I mean the, the small 19 row would have, but then you'd have a little bit of the grill covered and not the whole thing. This thing gives you all of the real estate width-wise. That's what's great about this. Um, this one is extremely robust. I know it's called heavy duty. Well, what does heavy duty mean? This thing, you have to get a hammer out in order to bend these fins. Uh, this thing could be mounted in front of your grill on your car and you wouldn't have to worry about it taking any damage. Um, the downside of this one is it is the most expensive one and it is physically the most, uh, the heaviest. I mean, it, it's the most expensive, you know? All right, and then finally we're going to discuss uh, the, the two that are really the, the stars of the show, if you will. These, these are the best performers. These are the dual, the dual pass, um, these are the other dual pass ones that we have here, but these are a different design style. So these are actually uh, two row, as I mentioned earlier, there's one in the front and one in the back. But uh, it, is, it is 19 row by the other convention. There are 19 rows here, um, and they are flat tubes. So inside of here are flattened tubes that have unmixed passages inside of them. It flows just like the previous one. Flow goes all the way across this way, goes down, comes back across. This is, uh, as you can see, this has really tiny tubes. The tubes are very, very small. So you could imagine that it's probably gonna have a higher pressure loss than the other ones. But the advantage here is that if you look at this one straight on, uh, there is a, a lot of airflow area on this one. So the K factor will be uh, very high on this one. Very, very good for airflow, which is what we want. The limitation on these is, is never really the fluid flow, it is the airflow, as, as I've probably mentioned a couple of times now. So uh, these have a lot of mounting provisions. They have uh, face mounted bolt holes. They have loops up here. Uh, a note though, is if you look at this, this actually has an extra set of fins on the bottom and top. This top piece is strictly structural. This is, not a, this is not an actual plate. Fluid only flows through the tubes. So we have 19 rows of tubes, but we actually have 20 rows of fins. Whereas on the other ones, we have you know 19 rows of plates, but nothing on top or bottom. That's it. Uh, these are available in only 19 and 25 row. Again, these are height wise, as I grab the other one here. And the unfortunate things to these is um, they're actually made just like radiators. So radiators and condensers, so they're actually fragile. You can bend these fins very easily. As you can probably see from the, the image, you can see that some of these fins are already deformed and that's just from me moving them around. Uh, we haven't mishandled these or anything. Uh, these have the biggest fins and the biggest fluid capacities, especially this one. This 25 row is a monster. Uh, it holds, hold on, it holds all of 26.4 ounces in this guy. Wait, no, that's the smaller one, hold on. The larger one holds almost 33 ounces. So this holds a lot of fluid inside of it. Uh, and as, as you can see, the 19 row versus 25 row in this family is much different than 19 row versus 25 row in the other family. Uh, and another consideration, like, like I was saying, the, these, these have side exits. So as opposed to these having top or bottom exits, you have to consider that you have lines coming off of this, off of the top. So for small area mounting, 
if you don't have room above or below, you're in a bad position. Whereas these, you have side outlets, inlets, they go this way. But yeah, this is considered 19 rows. This is considered 19 rows. Top plate, fluid flow. Bottom plate, fluid flow. Top plate, well, that's structure. So you just have all of that airflow area. All right. So that's the description of all of the exchangers. All right, so now that we've gone over some of the background as well as the units in question here, uh, I'd like to discuss how we design an experiment or how we did design the experiment. So initially with any experiment, you have to define your objective. Why are you performing the experiment? Well, it's because we wanna get deliverable comparators or metrics for the heat exchanger performance, one versus the next. Uh, so the numbers that I want to be able to produce from this are the, the actual Q output. Q is for the actual heat transferred, the numeric number, so the, the wattage, how much wattage is being pulled out. Um, the K factor, so that is the, like I said, the airflow, um, the cross-sectional airflow ability, the U value and the UA value. So as far as U and UA value, let's discuss that for a moment. Uh, U means overall tre uh, heat transfer coefficient. So the overall heat transfer coefficient is a rating for how well an exchanger is designed. And then we also have the UA value. UA literally means the U times the A value. But there are two U's and two A's for every exchanger. Uh, well, for every two fluid exchanger. The U value for the interior is not the same as the exterior. So when, when you look at these, the UA value is the same for, for the device, right? So this has a UA value. But when you consider the exterior cross-sectional, the exterior surface area, it's different than the interior cross-sectional area. So when you have the UA value, it is, again, U times A. Therefore, if the A for the exterior is different from the interior, then the U value for the interior is different from the exterior. But multiplied together, again, they achieve the same number. So we will be looking for the external U value and the external UA value for comparison's sake. And those pretty much are going to tell us, um, the U value will tell us how well it is designed. If I threw a number out there, it wouldn't mean anything, but if I give you a number on all of them, you can say, ah, one is designed better than the next because the U value is independent of surface area. It is just how well per unit of square, square unit of area does this heat exchanger perform. Um, an example of this would be if you have a very big exchanger that has a very low U value, well, it could have a very good UA value because it's massive. But if you compare it to a smaller exchanger that has a fantastic U value but a very small A, then they, they could, in theory, be the same UA but different U's. So that's just a, that's just one of the, the metrics by which we'll be comparing. And the last one is uh, effectiveness. So effectiveness is how you rate a heat exchanger for its instantaneous performance. So like in this application, how effective is it? And all that means is uh, if you are starting with, let's say 200 degree oil and you want to get it down to the ambient air temperature, which you don't in automotive, just follow me though. For the example's sake, you have 100 degree ambient air, you have 200 degree oil. 100% uh, effectiveness means that your oil entrance temperature matches your air inlet temperature. But uh, while that is, while it is attainable, you can imagine that would either require a massive exchanger, lots of air, or a very slow fluid flow. Uh, any of which could contribute, but it, it could require an absolutely massive heat exchanger. But it is possible. But that is how we rank it. So if one is more effective than the other, that again is per the application or per the specific experiment. So I'm sure plenty of you are asking yourself right now, why would I test all of these oil coolers using water when they're oil coolers? Well, there are a couple things that don't actually matter in an experiment like this, and it's because we're doing back-to-back -back comparison of all of these sort of on an equal playing field. So if we know all of the performance data of the cooler using water, let's say, in our case, then we can actually make a direct comparison between all of them because the performance data will be for that of the oil cooler using water. Uh, water does have the higher specific heat than oil uh, by up to double, approximately. but on the, on the experimental data side, it will still provide us with information about how well it works. Uh, the other thing was, of course, that we made a giant mess while doing this experiment with water, and it would have been an absolute disaster if we would have tried to use oil. So that's another consideration to uh, bear in mind. Uh, 
none of the stuff I've mentioned so far has anything to do with pressures. So pressures don't matter. Unless you're doing an actual phase change from a gas to a liquid, or a liquid to a gas, either way, pressure doesn't matter. The exchanger doesn't care what pressure it operates at. The, experimental, uh, the, the experiment didn't have to take any of that into account because the results don't depend on pressure. They, result, they completely revolve around mass flow rates. So it doesn't matter any of the other stuff, just mass flow rates of the fluids being used. So we were able to calculate our mass flow rates of our air, we were able to calculate our mass flow rates of our fluids, and that's all that it mattered on that side of things. Um, we also wanted to make good assumptions when we go into the, the experiment as well, such as um, humidity would be relatively consistent. It, it really didn't change very much. This is Texas. We had a lot of humidity. And we did all the tests back to back so that we would have all the data be consistent at least for, for that consideration. Um, the, the uniformity of flow, we assumed that our water pump was producing the same amount of water the whole time. Uh, we did use one of these bench power supplies that I have over here to control both the fan. For, uh, I have two power supplies, so one for the fan and one for the water pump. So the water pump was able to run at the exact same speed the whole time. The fan was able to run at exactly the same speed the whole time. And those are assumptions, because if there was a lot of variance in them, if they were a plug-in fan, we would probably have a good amount of variance that could affect the results. Uh, and then the most important thing here is how confident are we in our calculations? So I designed a an extensive calculator in a uh, MathCAD type program, which, which is the program that I learned in college as well as I use at my last job. Uh, it's just a giant programming kind of language. You write out all this stuff and it makes calculations. So I've gone through three or four iterations now of stuff to come up with the numbers I have now. And part of, part of almost the entire experiment comes back to me being confident in the calculator. Some of the parts of the calculation were actually very easy. So like coming up with the K factor and the Q value, very easy. Coming out with effectiveness, still very easy. U and UA values, very difficult. And then again, there were some of the assumptions on designs, some of the physical measurements. Uh, I'm reasonably confident in those. And also, I was able to play in the calculator if my measurement's off by a little bit put in a number, see how much the, the uh, end result changes, and then see, oh, okay, so if my measurement's off a little bit, this one won't really kill the experiment. All right, so the actual experimental setup, we, again, we used water, so water's uh, specific heat value is 4.2 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. So what that means is it takes 4.2 kilojoules of energy to raise one kilogram of water by one degree of Kelvin. For reference, the specific heat of oil is 2.2 kilojoules uh, for the, uh, a usual operating temperature. So it is less than what we were doing, but uh, still it's not like we're an absolute order of magnitude off uh, on a different realm. Um, but water again was an easier fluid to work with. We used the bench power supplies as I mentioned, those are them right there. We used these Bosch sensors for measuring uh, temperature of the fluids and I used these mounted these are AN fittings they mounted right on the end so we were tape taking our temperatures right at the end and this is the the Bosch PSTF1 sensor the reason I use these sensors is because after all of this experimental stuff I wanted to put these on cars and be able to measure the pressure loss data since the car will be generating uh, plenty of pressure and then after calculating all this other stuff I'll be able to pull the data back and get some on car actual data for pressure and temperature so again, I had one on the inlet and one on the outlet. Next thing, we used the GMIAT sensors, the fast response ones, which is this little guy, as many of you have probably seen before, used them on uh, a lot of different applications. So I have one that was sitting in front of the exchanger, about six inches, and then another one behind it. Um, we used a spall fan, and we ran this at three different speeds, so a low speed, a medium speed, and a high speed. Uh, which we measured the airspeed using a Testo 410, which is a rotary vane anemometer. I have that guy right here. It has the ability to take average speeds as well. So what you do for pulling average uh, air velocity, obviously the, well, maybe not obviously, but the air velocity across this is not gonna be uniform with a fan. You're gonna have a lot of speed in the middle and not a lot towards the edges. So what you do is you hold this here and you set it to average function and then you just trace the face of this to get the average speed of air across it to which we use the air. Uh, there is a way in the experiment uh, in, the, in, the, in the calculator side of things 
to match those numbers and see if your numbers are in good confidence because the amount of heat lost from the water has to be picked up by the air. Therefore, the air rate and the fluid rate have to come out as the same Q out versus Q in value. And I have that in the calculator as well, so we can, we can go over that. As far as the actual uh, ducting setup, I tried a couple of things and what I came up with is giant chunks of household foam. We cut them up. I wish I could have made these a lot longer for better flow development, but unfortunately this was already difficult enough to make as is. This is a um, swept profile. What you do is you draw uh, your rectangle on your one side, you draw your circle on the other side, you put a hot wire through it, and you, you trace them at the same uh, rate. It, it, was, uh, it was quite the, ex it was quite the uh, experience. But we made one of these per each exchanger. So this cutaway matches, I believe it goes to this exchanger. So the cutaway for this exchanger is able to match up to this so you have ducted flow up to it. And then as you see, we have the intake air temp sensor hanging down in the middle there. So it's able to pick up there. We had it hanging like that. So it would be able to detect what heat was coming out of the exchanger. Uh, this was operated on suction, not on, uh, not on it, was, it was on pull, not push mode. So we, we mounted the fan to this side, we mounted the exchanger to this side, and then we pulled air through the exchanger across the sensor. So for our heat source, we used a turkey pot, and it, it's just the giant turkey fryer set up with propane. We just heated the crap out of it, ran the pump. Uh, we, we did have a water pump again, uh, which was hooked up to the other, uh, the other one of those, and it was run at a, a lower voltage. Because again, we didn't need to run it at a crazy high voltage for no reason. Uh, and then the, the turkey pot was able to keep on heating up until we reached approximately 90 Celsius, so close to 200 degrees Fahrenheit. And then we turned the fan on, clicked log on the computer, and started logging the data. So that way we would start out with a relatively hot temperature and we could see some good demonstration of cooling data. Uh, most of the days that we were we tried to do this experiment because I, I performed the experiment multiple times. Um, it was a it was high 90s outside, high 90 uh, Fahrenheit, so about 40 Celsius. Um, for logging, we used the SSI 4 Plus by Innovate Motorsports, uh, and then I had to make a little breadboard for connecting all the sensors because they're all resistor based. All right, so this video ended up being a lot longer than I expected, but there is a lot of stuff that had to be discussed. So. I'm going to go ahead and separate this video from the next one, and we're going to go over all of the experimental data in the following video. Thanks for watching.